So how's um, everybody doing? I almost went skiing this morning. Pretty cold there. <laughs> Did you have a snow day? I think pretty much every day that so far has been a snow day when you think about it. <laughs> yep. Thank you for getting my joke. Okay. So any questions about anything? Okay, so we saw um, how um, electrons um, interact with, uh, with photons, so with radiation, and how they can move from um, one energy level to a different one. So atoms can absorb um, uh, photons, and so the electrons will jump to another, to a higher energy level. The electron can also decay to a lower energy level, and that will uh, emit a photon. And that's pretty much how um, we know so much about uh, about the universe. I mean, like almost everything that we see in the sky, it's a it's a point. So it has no structure. It's just you know the, the analysis that we can do of those uh, absorption and, and emission lines. So um, now that we know a little bit about the details, we can uh, come up with a framework that is a little bit more general. So we looked at uh, radiative um, energy transport before in the context of uh, stars. So the, the quantity of interest over there was uh, L. Uh, in that case, it was a function of the direction of the position of the frequency and of the time. And we were looking at it in a cross section and also as a the per energy range. So we're going to work again with this guy, except that it's going to be time independent. And so the four processes that we uh, looked at before that can change the uh, energy density L were uh, transport, Uh, absorption scattering and emission and the emission could be either thermal or nuclear so in this case we know that transport doesn't really uh, affect the, the phonons, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the photons. So the matter is moving and, you know, it might bring along some of the radiation, but there's, um, there's no radiation traveling from one side to the other. So we can ignore this one. Uh, 
Um, the other one that we're going to uh, ignore is scattering because scattering is uh, non-correlated um, photons. Mm. Actually, these are correlated. The absorption is a non-correlated. Uh, but when the atom, uh, or whatever it is, an electron or whatever, scatters the, the photon, it's going to send it in random directions. And based on what we were looking at last time, um, we might have you know, our, our cloud and dust over there. Uh, have a light source over here, let's say, that is going to go through the cloud. And the scattering is going to go in every direction. So we're, we cannot trace it back uh, you know, directly to this particular source of light. Um, so there's not, I guess there's some stuff that we can learn about it, but the two main things that we're going to look at are absorption and emission. So with these two, you can have um, this is your interstellar medium. It can be the uh, the observer over here. There's going to be a direct line, so it will go. You know, this line depends on what you're interested in in observing. So you could look at you know an energy source that is uh, behind or even in the middle of the of the cloud, or you can look at the emission. Uh, by the cloud, mostly, most likely a uh, thermal emission. So, you know, that is the, the defining characteristic that you can just have a, a direct a straight line. So, What we had for absorption before was the the kappa absorption, which was a function of the frequency and the position. And then we also had the density which was a function of the position. For emission, we had something similar, uh, but emission, you know, absorption is only in the direction that you're looking at. Emission can happen in, in every direction, including the one we're looking at, of course. So we had J, a function of the frequency and the position and the density and then divided by uh, 4 pi which is the solid angle uh, and c the speed of light so this is like a volume um, you can so you can get the number of emitters in the in that volume with the density so this is really what we're looking at, but we're going to um, replace them. We just to make it a little bit more tractable. 
Uh, so this is going to be k, a function of the frequency and the position. And this is going to be G, capital J. Also, uh, frequency and position and divided by the 4 pi C. Uh, okay, so the equation Oh, this is getting more difficult to erase. The equation that we saw at the beginning of the semester was this one. Um, yeah, L. We have a bunch of things over there. So the frequency, the direction, the position. This was equal to one minus k. Something like you. Well, I'm I think I can't see the upper half of the equation. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, actually, I think I'm going to put it over here because it's kind of it's a little long. It's um, minus k. Right, so we have the absorption part, and the absorption depends on the energy density. So if you have no energy density, then no matter what the absorption is, this term is going to be zero. And the emission. And this is the gradient, so it's in three dimensions. Um, but since we're looking in only, you know, as a, we're looking in a straight line, then we can get rid of all the references to the normal vector. for our particular case. And because we're going in a straight line, this is only uh, in one dimension instead of three. So we can call that uh, the ds. Um, and we can replace, so x here will be n s. Um, because we're getting rid of the n, we can just replace it with s. So this makes it a little easier. Would we also get rid of the 4 pi in the emission as well, because we're looking at one dimension? No, because the emission is still. So we're, lo we're looking at the emission that comes at you, but this is getting essentially like uh, what percentage of that emission you know, you're looking at. So you're dividing by the whole volume. Otherwise, you will get. Um, yeah, it will be too much. You will be saying that everything that is ra radiated in uh, 4 pi, you're getting it in a straight line. But yeah, so it looks 
Um, a little friendlier, not the best. Um, very well. So we can look. Uh, let me see if the eraser is a problem. So if the absorption, can, can you see that or is it too high? I can see it. Um, if there's almost no absorption, and it's very light, then you have uh, this equation. So that one is pretty easy to solve. You can just put the DS over here. And we integrate uh, on both sides. This integral is gonna be from S1 to S. So S1 is you know, a point of interest, so If you're looking at you know, a star that is um, you know, enclosed by the gas or after the cloud, then you might want to put S1 over there. And S is where the observer is. But if you're looking at uh, a place in, inside the cloud, then you can put that one in there. So this is just, you know, where you're looking at. And S is from where you're looking uh, at. So then you get over here L of BS minus L of, sorry, nu, nu um, S1. And this one is just one over four pi c integral. This one is also from S one to S, and that one in general you cannot uh, simplify it further. So that that emission is going to depend on. Um, where S is. So the emission might be different, you know, if you're looking at a star or if you're looking at a point in the, in the cloud. Uh, but that's, you know, the, the friendly version. Um, the one that is less friendly is when this, you know, the absorption is not, uh, it's not negligible. Give me a second. Okay. 
Okay. Hope that's better. So we can define um, this optical depth. And I think we looked at it before. So the definition of the optical depth is an integral from S1 to S of K, uh, which is a function of the frequency and the position and the S. So this is Weinberg uh, 3.1.3, I think, uh, four. So what I did over here, I'm going to omit this uh, frequency and position just because it gets really crowded. And I hope that I don't get too lost. Then it will be K uh, DS. So this means that K is the tau ds, optical length. So this optical length has some desirable properties. Uh, if S is approximately equal to S1, then what do you expect? the optical depth to be. And there will be, this integral will be very small, so this will be close to zero, right? So this essentially tells you how much light you still get um, at a particular depth. For example, if you are um, you know, in the forest and there's uh, fog or uh, you know, like smoke or something like that, uh, then you know, the, the absorption properties are going to be uh, different. So depending on what you have is how far you can, uh, you can look into. Although fog is very interesting. Oh, I will not. Have you driven in fog, like really heavy fog? Anybody? Yes, and I can assure you it's a terrible mistake. <laughs> so uh, if you have the, the high beams, it's actually worse than if you have the low beams because of all the scattering, you just see like white everywhere. Um, I guess another really cool one was um, one time at Burning Man, there was this um, sandstorm. It was super heavy. So I could not see my hand like in front of my face. So optical depth, not, not a lot. Uh, I guess sand absorbs a lot of sun <laughs> or light. Okay. So then, so DL, DS, is the minus K, uh, del, plus J, divided by four pi, C. So we can uh, replace K with 
the tau ds. So this will be equal to So then we can divide this one uh, by d tau and this one. by minus and the ds over here, multiply everything by the tau. So then we can put this one over here and this one over here. This is a ds, this is a d tau, and the d tau is k ds, so We can get rid of the ESs over here. So DL D tau is uh, minus L plus J over four pi C divided by K. So this is a good form to have it, to have the, the absorption and the, uh, the emission quantities uh, in, the same, in the same term. Okay, so, oh man, this is getting worse. Must be the temperature, right? Okay. So then we can add this um, exponential tau. Tau is a function of uh, frequency and position. And then dl, d tau, We're just multiplying by into the negative tau uh, on both sides. And we remember, realize that So just the um, the product rule. So this is equal to which looks um, 
is that part? This part is this one. Mm, no, this part is the other one. So this goes here. This one goes here. So we can um, replace it with this term over here. Is it, isn't the sign of one of them wrong? Like shouldn't the, the right one be positive? I have one of them wrong. You will see at the end, but I haven't seen where my mistake is. <laughs> okay. I have a negative <laughs> wrong. Um, so then, the detail, e to the negative tau L so we get that um, we can move this the tau over here. Take the integral. And so j is a function of uh, frequency and position. And k is also a function of the frequency and position. Um, but together, uh, they are not a function of the position. So that is of course an assumption, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty accurate. So what you're saying is that the ratio of emitters and absorbers is going to be, it's not going to depend on where you are. Um, so, if you're looking at just the emitters or just the observers, yes, it depends on the position, you know, it depends on density and everything. Uh, but uh, the ratio uh, does not. So then you can take it out of the integral. So uh, from this one, we're going to get L equals L. And then this is function of the frequency and S1. That's why I'm putting it in there. Um, this so one we can take it out, so it's just j, which is a function of the frequency, divided by the 4 pi c k, which is a function of the frequency. And then we have this one and s, e to the negative tau d tau. Um, so, um, oh, I missed a, an e to the negative tau over here. So, if you look at Weinberg, um, where's my Weinberg?
have the negative on this side, uh, the inverse exponential, and over here in Weinberg, this one is is, is negative, uh, but it should be positive according to what I was developing. So that one, I haven't gotten it yet, but I trust that um, Weinberg is correct. Like three times I've been like, he's wrong. Then I think more about it and he's, he's always right. So uh, this one then can be simplified. And so you get This one I'm going to write it down completely. So frequency and position. Frequency and position. L. Frequency and position. Frequency, frequency. Frequency and position. It's just solving um, the integral. So, you know, the, the cool thing about this is that you have this term over here, the j over k. So what is that? How do we calculate it? Is that related to maybe what we what we saw last time? Should be, right? Okay, so It's just getting worse. Wait, 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 I have a question. Yes. I don't quite get the optical depth exactly. Like, what? what is it? Is it like how far, like, your average photon travels inside a medium, or? Um, you, you can think about it as how dark it looks at a certain depth. I mean, like if you, you know, on a clear day, you go up the mountain and you can see the whole city, right? Yeah. Um, but if it's, if it's like a dusty day, then you can only see maybe half of it. Yeah. So the optical depth is, uh, it, it changes, it depends on, on the conditions. Mm -hmm. So maybe another way okay. to think about it is, um,
how deep into it you can you can look into you know whatever you're looking at. So if it's a, a okay. interstellar medium or like uh, you know sandstorm, how far into it? So all right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So in 1917, uh, Einstein defined this quantity. So it is the rate so time rate at which uh, an atom spontaneously uh, transitions from uh, energy level A to energy level B. And A is a Energy A is uh, higher than uh, energy B. So it goes from A to B. So if the energy difference is um, EA minus EB, What is the, the frequency of this photon? So it's that multiplied by the speed of light divided by Planck's constant? Just Planck's constant? Yeah. Um, this will be the frequency, right? Oh, yeah. So you just divide it by um, Planck's constant to get the frequency that you're observing. So these guys are called uh, Einstein coefficients. And as you might imagine, um, you have different Einstein coefficients for different uh, both uh, energy levels and atoms or molecules. So how sharp is this uh, frequency going to be? So let's say that you set up your experiment, um, you know, you're, you have your atom in there, and you're waiting for the atom to one of the electrons to move to a lower energy level and emit a, a photon. How sharp is this measurement? Assuming that you have you know, a perfect experimental setup. Pretty sharp. Uh, infinitely sharp? Mm. So what I mean is, yeah, you have your, I think it was. your intensity here and your frequency here, and you're saying, uh, Ramon, that it's a, a delta function. Yes or no? Or I guess, yeah, or yeah, unless like the uncertainty principle makes it a little bit wide. Or, Otherwise, it should be like that. What do you think the effect of the uncertainty principle will be? So, delta E delta T greater than or equal uh, H bar over 2. 
Isn't it over two pi? Um, I think it means... No, no, h bar is already over two pi, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, probably is it. Mm, well, we don't really care about time, so... So the energy shouldn't be that, like, that uncertain. Yeah, but you're saying but that, is, that it's a delta function, so delta E is, you know, it goes to zero. Yeah. So if it goes to zero, that means that mm, the delta T goes to infinity. So what would that mean? Oh, never mind. That means that you take your measurement forever. Not only that you take the measurement forever, but that this photon is produced forever. But we know that that doesn't happen, right? Like the, there's a, a delta T in which this transition happens. So that means that- So all the transition is constantly happening. Well, mm, no, that cannot happen. This is a, this might be a little subtle, but if you have, let's say that you have, you know, enough uh, atoms that are producing uh, photons of this frequency. Uh, even if you have a continuous supply of photons of this um, frequency, they are produced individually, you know, by the by each transition, and each transition is limited in time. So that means that this is going to have some width, you know, that is just inherent from the quantum mechanics. Gotcha. So, well, this is some, I study this kind of effect, but in, in phonons. So, you know, if you have a, if you imagine like a, a you know, balls uh, joined with springs, uh, and these are ideal springs, you know, like uh, uh, hoops or holes, and, you move it, you, know, you move it up and down or something, the wave will start propagating. And if they are perfect, these springs, then this wave will propagate forever. Um, so this delta T will be, will go to infinity. Uh, that doesn't happen in, in solids uh, either. The waves start interacting with each other and that's what causes these changes in energy. So, the point is that there is a lot that you can learn about the actual transition from looking at its distribution. So, you know, it is, it is a small uh, contribution, but it's going to be there. So maybe it's going to look, that's grossly exaggerated, uh, but you're going to have some, some line width, finite line width uh, due to uh, quantum mechanics. So the other effect, which is actually bigger, um, so uh, I'm thinking that this chemical is bad for one force. So, let's see. So the probability that you produce a photon in a frequency range, frequency range will be uh, nu, nu plus d nu, 
is uh, phi of mu d mu. So this is a distribution function, uh, which is going to look you know, kind of like this. So yeah, this is probably going to look uh, into a first approximation is probably going to look like a Gaussian. It's probably not going to look completely Gaussian if you look in detail. Maybe a, a Lorentzian, and there's going to be some other effects. So the this probability distribution is normalized. And so the rate of emission per volume and per solid angle and per frequency interval is going to be uh, the distribution function for the frequency, the probability per unit time that this transition happens the number of atoms or emitters that you have uh, in the system, and then it's divided by the solid angle. Because they can go in, 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 any, well, in, in every direction. So, It's going to take the photon of time uh, ds over c to the speed of light to travel in you know, the distance uh, ds. So the amount of additional radiant energy, uh, I want to, uh, J, it's going to be um, H bar uh, nu. So the amount of energy, then the probability. And I guess everything else. And this is a, we had the volume over there. Uh, so this one was divided by the four pi C, which can eliminate. So this is going to be the the emission. So the other effect you know that is going to broaden this and it's going to be more is more significant than uh, the uncertainty principle. <laughs> is the Doppler shift. So the observed frequency is going to be the actual frequency, AB, and then 1 minus V over C. So what do you think that velocity is going to be? This one. Let's say that you know this is some cloud in between stars, some interstellar cloud.
are the particles in that cloud going to be moving? Well, of course. Yeah, but like in random directions, no? So you're going to get Doppler shift in both ways? That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's going to broaden in both directions. So what is going to be that velocity? Probably the one you get from from the temperature. Yep, we saw it before. So it's the um, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So the one is P. Uh, the probability of having a velocity that is so pi kdt. Um, instead of being to the three halves, it's going to be to the one half because you're looking at only one direction. So you're looking at a component um, of the velocity in the direction that you're um, parallel to the direction that you're looking at. Okay, so it's hard to see, but um, you know how it looks like. The point here is that the velocity distribution is going to depend on the mass of the particle and definitely on the, on the temperature. So if you see a larger broadening, of the emission line. Um, what would that tell you about the temperature? You know, so it's, it's exactly the same frequency. You identify this one, you know that it's, I don't know, um, hydrogen alpha or something. If the burning is greater, the temperature is what? Higher. Higher. So you can measure the temperature of um, like any material, right? Uh, any body, so stars or clouds, by looking at the burning in their in their emission lines. Uh, so you, know, you can subtract, if you want, the inherent broadening due to quantum mechanics, uh, a certain principle. But you know, this one is going to be dominant, uh, definitely at, at higher temperatures. So then uh, this one, the the distribution, Uh, you can write it as with Doppler shift C over a new AB and then the probability. So it's going to be this probability, the Ma Maxwell Boltzmann, and uh, the velocity. It's going to be uh, C. 1 minus uh, 1 frequency over the, the real one. Right, so you can feed this distribution, uh, Maxwell Boltzmann, to what you observe to find out temperatures and things like that. So uh, pretty useful. So there's uh, the other one. Um, it's exactly the same.
So this one was for emission. The one for uh, absorption. is HV. This one has two terms. This one has only the A, A, B. The absorption one has, uh, it's called B. B, A, and B. Minus B, A, B, and A. And this is because um, when the uh, when your absorber, you know, an atom absorbs a particular frequency, uh, then that particular frequency might stimulate uh, the emission of other of other radiation. So you know, maybe it goes to a certain level, but you know, the one right below it is more stable, so it will uh, emit that. So you have the you know, the Einstein coefficient. So this is the uh, emission, um, absorption, and the stimulated emission. So what do you think that um, you know, if you know some thermodynamics that you can find? Uh, J and K. Well, these uh, densities, the number density, the number of uh, emitters or absorbers that you have uh, per unit volume. Uh, it's going to, they're going to arrange themselves uh, in some thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, the distribution is going to be given by what? Any guesses? What is this? Those are Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Close, close. I think they're just Boltzmann. Each Boltzmann? Yeah, they're Boltzmann distribution. So um, how do they arise, or where do they arise from? Well, these are your, um, this is your energy, and this is how many um, how many uh, particles you have in this particular um, energy state. So if the temperature is really low, this moves you know, a lot to, towards zero. So it might look, look like this. And as you increase the temperature, then you have um, uh, 
um, more energy states that are allowed by the temperature. So they're going to populate those higher energies, uh, those higher energy states, but you will always have more particles in a lower energy state than in a higher energy state. Um, and the GA and the GB, it's uh, the multiplicity. So how many um, states you have with the same, with the same energy. So that will give you the ratio between the absorbers, uh, sorry, the emitters and the absorbers. So the condition that Einstein um, applied or used to reach this uh, was that if you see black body radiation coming from whatever you're observing, then these changes, you know, the, the absorption and the emission, they are going to kind of cancel uh, out. And so you should not see you know, any differences uh, in the spectrum. So this is the, the ratio of uh, emitters and absorbers that maintains the black body radiation uh, unchanged. So, yep, and I guess Einstein did a lot of uh, thermodynamics. All right, so that's what I have for you today. So uh, questions, comments, anything else? Yeah, are the, are the coefficients for emitters the same in K as in J? Or are they just separate? Or they're mm -hmm. different in A's? The coefficients? This yeah, one the, and this one? Yeah, I mean. The same. So, you know, they absorb uh, a photon here, but then they become uh, emitters. So these, um, you know, I guess now we can get them from uh, first principles, the Einstein coefficients, but you know, uh, at the time, basically you can only feed them from uh, observational data. Just, it's pretty interesting. Yes. Cool. All right. Um, I'll see you next time then. See you on Thursday. Okay, bye. Thank you, bye.